Okay, so let's just do some housekeeping, okay, and then let's move on. Um, just some announcements that we have. So we need speakers. That's what we want to say. So if you want to speak about Azure Networking, Infra, Event Grid, this is just look some of the topics that we know that the audience wants sessions on. But if you want to speak on other topics, then we can see if that those make sense or not, depending on if we already talked about it or not. Um, I'm sure that we can arrange. And one of the things that we always like to do is we like to help you starting uh, to speak in events if that is something that you want. And if you say, yeah, I would love, but you know, I'm not confident about it. I don't have experience in speaking. Sure. Okay. Uh, we all don't worry. Have... Don't worry. Neither do we. So <laughs> yeah, neither do we. And we are always <laughs> nervous when we when we when we start to do a session. Like that's that's normal. Um, so just 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 come, and we will kind of try to help you the best to our capabilities. And I'm sure that the first sessions that you're going to do, they are not going to be perfect, but Hey, look, we have to start somewhere. So just come and we will help you. And I'm sure the community um, will love uh, what you have to talk about because we all have different experiences. And look, every experience is great to to understand and, and to see. So just reach out to some of us. Um, we have today, uh, it's me, Pedro, Sandro, and Virginia. I think Virginia is also on the call. So yeah, reach yeah. out to one of us on social networks, reach out to the Azure community group on social networks, and we, we can we can help you on, on achieving that. Okay. Next sessions we're going to have October the 6th. So go to your meetup page and uh, to our meetup page, and we already have that, that one there. It's going to be Peter the Tender. And in November, we have Nico that is going to give us a session around SQL managed instances. Okay. Uh, so Nico is a former MVP, Microsoft MVP, uh, Portuguese MVP, but he uh, just basically passed to the dark side. Okay, so now it's an <laughs> FTE of Microsoft. So we always like to say this. Um, so he has an amazing session prepped uh, to talk about managed instances. We still don't have the date exactly closed with him, but this will be really, really soon. I think this week we can we can close that. It will show up on the Meetup page, so just watch out for for that. And an announcement that we kind of have is that yes, we are. I, I don't think there's a people asking me. Hey, it, yeah, to have, like, yeah, I don't know. <coughs> your audio. Your audio. I don't know if everyone else is yeah. having the issue, but your audio is coming and going. Yeah. It'll what about be, now? Yeah, it's it'll good be good, though. and then it'll be like a tin can. Okay. Let me let me try to push the mic a little bit closer to me then. Okay, so plans for 2022. Yes, we're going to do a session around um, around Azure. So it's like a one day or two day a, uh, community conference, and we want we want it to be in person. So that's the plan. Let's see how it goes. Okay, it's still a way uh, to do something like this. Um, we know we are in the pandemic, so yeah, we yeah. we really want to do this. We don't promise anything. That's that's the the key word that we want to say. And now let's just uh, know our speaker a little bit better. I think everyone already knows Scott, but um, I don't know, Pedro. Do you have any questions for Scott? Well, um, I know I know that Scott uh, is also a teacher, and we uh, share that that passion for teaching people and sharing knowledge. But what do you really love, Scott? Um, as a teacher, what is your? Why do you, do you want to be a teacher? Um, being a teacher is about empowering people to do things that they didn't think that they could do. So it's nice when you're talking to someone, whether they're early in career or a child or a young person or an older person who's been doing something for many years, and then they they go and say, "Oh, wow, I didn't know I could do that." And then they leave your talk and then they have power that they did not have before your talk. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. It does a lot. Yeah, uh, that's kind of my whole thing. Like I just everyone makes things more complicated than they need to generally in life. I think we tend <laughs> to overcomplicate things. 
And it's nice to be able to say, hey, look, you know, it's actually not as complicated as you think it is. You know, it. a lot of people spend a lot of time, um, we say gnashing their teeth. You know, have you ever heard that term? It's just like gnashing and biting mm-hmm. your teeth and like grinding your teeth when the solutions are usually quite simple. So I like sharing simple solutions so that people might say, oh, wow, now I can do that and uh, hang out with my family. Right. Or be like Sandro and bring my boss to work here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, We can we can relate this also to to your your work and and your sharing about diabetes. um, Mm. Right. Yeah. Because. It's it's related. If you if you have a, a a condition, you you can be uh, work and and right. Everybody has something. Everybody has something. Yeah, I'm colorblind, blind, so these guys always tease me about my t-shirts, colors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah. Oh, okay. I thought that you because you're colorblind, that must be why your webcam looks like that. <laughs> also also yeah yeah uh, i've come uh, this damn window near me it's really bright no i'm teasing yeah it's, that was it's too the good. sun's that was too good. That is, that is just, just lighting on peter's face yeah the best yeah the best part is that i'm going to be doing this uh throughout the presentation and um and he's never going to notice so just as as we go for the talks, I'm going to be just changing the background and seeing if, if Pedro notices the difference. I, I can see some change, but I can't I can't identify anything on the. I have the rain the rainbow going behind. Yeah, I'm seeing it. You know, I'm Scott Hunter, it. Scott Hunter, my boss on .NET is colorblind, and we always know when we show him the uh, the testing UI because mm-hmm. we would have red and green for like tests yeah. passing, and you know, there's that term red green refactor yeah and you would make it make a test you make it fail it's red then you fix mm-hmm. it and then it's green and then refactor so scott hunter who is colorblind would say it's gray gray refactor for me is more or less the same okay yeah yeah same so he always tells us make the color better so the colorblind so that's actually a thing that we're doing in visual studio is making sure colorblind people have a choice in visual studio to mm-hmm. um, to do that, and it's also I think built into Windows 11 now. Uh, oh, I have to do the switch then. Yeah, let me find it. It's, there's a there's a there's a mode for changing colors for contrast. So it's good stuff. Okay, okay. Yeah, that that was one of the things that I was going to ask is about like Windows 11. We have like tons of um, at least for what I have been reading because I I really tried to use it, but it didn't work out for me. But Perfect. about accessibility and i think accessibility is is kind of one of the things that i'm i'm pushing a lot too especially because look one of the things that i do is i teach people azure and um when we are doing this remotely we have always you know challenges and i think it's 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 important to try to include the most people that we can and that is one of the reasons why we're doing this on on teams because we can have captions okay people can can put captions on their teams and and there are some some ecosystem in terms of accessibility and um, yeah that's one of the things trying to push this to more and more people um, and in the pandemic one of the things that we love is the reach that our community had it's no longer a local community that we meet only in person but we can reach other people that are in other areas in the world that they don't have access Mm -hmm. to the speakers that we can bring. They don't have access to the knowledge um, that we can share. And I think like you said, Scott, that's really important is the the reach and the empowering that that we can have. That's that's really really cool, a really cool way to say it. Yeah, even even the four of us, right? We we are in three different cities. Um, Yeah. this bring us, brings us all together, and we have we have guests here from other countries and than Portugal. So hmm? it's it's empowering to to see all of this 
actually, let me show you something cool. Uh, by the way, I put a chat to you, Tiago. I can't put it. For some reason, it says you can't send messages because you're not a member of the chat. Hmm. Yeah, I have the same issue, Tiago. Well, yeah, there are people writing stuff on the. Um, no, I see, I see it, but I, I don't know. But I gave you a, a link to, that you can drop in there for the accessibility stuff. Okay, but I will. Actually, I'll me, drop. I'll drop the link. Send it to me, and I will drop it there. Let me show you something cool. I did this talk for uh, in Brazil, and I uh, I happened to be on a group of people who they didn't have a lot of English, so I was using PowerPoint. Uh, which is a new, and there's a new feature in PowerPoint here. So oh, I was giving yeah. my PowerPoint presentation, and then at the bottom of the PowerPoint, they would add um, the translation in real time. And you see how good it is? It's pretty yeah. fast. They just loved it. So then I just kept my terminal here on this white square, and then they would watch at the bottom. That's built into PowerPoint now, and you just go up here. And check it out. There's like tons of languages now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's crazy. And you can put uh, it wherever you want, and like lay it out differently. Put it below the slide, or put it on. Oh, that one, it. that one I didn't knew about the. Oh, above. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So look. So then you can have the slide like this, and then yeah. put it over the top. Yeah, because there, sometimes we have slides to show that they are not accessible. So the bottom part of the slide is yep. it, it, it has some icons or some some design there that we that we can't yeah, put stuff up. over it. That, that's pretty cool. Yeah, Portuguese from Portugal. Awesome. From Portugal, yeah, awesome. Yeah, but as long I think I think there is one thing missing there. There is no Klingon, right? <laughs> I don't know if we have any Klingons here today. Let's yeah, find out I think, I think Bing says. Bing can can translate the Klingon. So, well, it translated the word Klingon. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's yeah. that's not good. That that that's that's yeah, I'll say it here. Huh? So, that's good. Oh, we have track cool. is here. Pretty good. Just okay. Saying. Okay, so let's let's give the yeah. floor to I think Scott. Can take control, Scott. And okay. we can start. You can start, Scott. We, okay. Just <clears throat> One thing I would say, since we have such a small group, um, then please put questions in the chat in like real time. That would be really helpful to me. <clears throat> Otherwise, I'm just giving a YouTube, you know. Mm -hmm. And since I'm really here live, it would be super helpful to have people putting questions. I won't be able to answer because I don't have access to the chat, but I'll answer verbally. Um, that would be really cool. Um, so I don't want to just like talk to myself. So feel free to interrupt, Tiago or Pedro. Just unmute and, and interrupt because it's such a small group. It's better to yeah. do it more dynamic. We'll, cool? we'll, yeah. we'll drop we'll drop the questions to you uh, from the chat if you want to. Yeah, I can see the chat. I just can't interact with the chat. Okay. Okay. All right. Cool. And then let me. I'm going to open up. We're going to do our presentation in Notepad and Terminal. And I'll explain what's going on. And then if you wouldn't mind, yeah, thank you for leaving your cameras on. That way I'm not alone. Because sometimes I'll give a talk and then everybody will uh, turn off their camera and then I'm just by myself in my office and that's kind of sad. Okay. So if we go to Hanselman.com and I click on the blog and we go to the date. I've been blogging since April of 2002, so it's coming up on, it'll be 20 years April. And um, can pretty, you know, I, I slowed down during the pandemic, but pretty consistently Tuesday and Thursday for 20 years. Um, so it's a good pace. It's not like so much blogging that it's overwhelming and it's a full-time job. But, you know, I feel like once or twice a week is a good uh, as a good a good amount, okay? Um, and I've been running it, uh, this here, as well as Hanselman.com, the, the main kind of brochure, you know, the homepage, and the podcast now. The podcast has been going on for 804 episodes. So if we scroll all the way to their very first episode, that was in 2006. So 15 years podcast 20 years blogging. So we have three sites to deal with. Hanselman.com, 
Hansel.com slash blog, HanselMinutes.com, which is the podcast. And then we have like a dozen small sites because everybody has like the stupid little one pagers and stuff that they make in their life. Uh, these are like almost basically static sites. Now, I was a Microsoft MVP for 10 or 15 years. And sometimes companies will give MVPs free stuff. Not like a lot of free stuff, but a little bit. And one of the things that they gave me like 15 years ago was a virtual machine. And the company was called Orcs, Orcs Web. And it was basically a, a free Windows machine on Orcs Web. It was hosting. So I was like, cool, I'll put my blog on Orcs Web. And then I'll have a little graphic that says hosting provided by Orcs Web. And uh, I set that up and I forgot about it. So it was running on Windows 2008. And I would have to remote desktop into that machine. And I was using IIS. And I was using .NET 3. And then later, uh, .NET uh, 4.6. But we're talking about uh, a system that even today is 13 years old. So we've got Windows, it's a virtual machine, and it's IIS, and I'm running uh, my blog. And my blog software is called DOS Blog, which is German for the blog. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then uh, Hanselman.com. So DOS Blog is here. The podcast is Razor, and the homepage is Razor, Razor Pages. These are ASP.net. So all of this is ASP.net. But the DOS blog is web forms, which is an older technology. And I put it on this virtual machine and I forgot about it because it was free. And then Orcs Web got bought, got purchased by a Canadian company called SureWeb. And I didn't think anything of it. And then one day my blog was down and I remote desktop into the blog. And I was noticing that I had to delete some logs because I was running out of disk space. So this is on Windows Server 2008. And it turns out my disk was only 30 gigs. I would remote into the desktop every month and I would delete the log files to make space. And uh, it was becoming tedious. So then I was thinking I would make a scheduled task to go and delete the log files. Um, but then I said, maybe I should just have this made larger. I should ask them to increase the size. So then I called the support people. I called support and said, hey, this is Scott Hanselman. I'm running my blog on your virtual machine. Can you give me more space? And they said, who? And I said, well, no, I'm Scott. You have, you know, I have a blog there. And they said, we have no record of you being a person. And then we started digging around, and it turns out that not only had they lost me and forgotten who I was as a human, but what I thought was a virtual machine, I thought it was a VM. It was a real computer. It was the oldest computer that they had. So all this time, I thought I had a VM that they were backing up regularly. It was a real PC with actual spinning disks sitting in someone's office and it was dying. And I said, well, can you expand the hard drive? And they said, we'd have to go and find it, buy a hard drive, image it and put the hard drive back in. I think you just maybe need to find better hosting somewhere else. So that was really scary because all these years I thought I was running a VM and having it backed up. And really it was just, a, a, a tower computer under, you know, Tiago's desk. And, you know, if, if someone kicked it, then it would be over for me. So I immediately blah, uh, you know, went into FTP and I backed everything up, frantic backup. But then I started thinking about these domains and realizing that uh, by, because I was using IIS, I was getting some benefits. IIS treats subdirectories as applications. So if you're familiar with how IIS works, you can just go and make a folder called slash blog or slash whatever. You could say create application, and then this is an app, 
and this is an app, right? However, that's not how Azure works, right? So I needed to think about how to how to how to make sure I didn't do anything. I didn't break anything. Let's let's go and figure out what our requirements are. Requirements are move to the cloud, probably Azure because I work here. Uh, break nothing. That's a pretty big requirement. That means no broken URLs. Minimal downtime. Now, I'm not a big business, right? I'm just a guy with a blog. Uh, so I can maybe do it on a Sunday night and I could be down for an hour, but I don't want to be down for weeks. So minimal downtime. Bonus requirements. Linux. Move to .NET Core and be cheap because I don't want to spend any money on this thing. Because remember, I'm spoiled here. I'm working on a free account. Now this is going to cost me like $100. I, I don't want it to cost me. I, I don't have $200 a month. Like maybe I can spend $50 or $100, right? Yes, Tiago, bonus not on a real machine. Then that brings us to questions. Is this a lift and shift operation? Lift and shift, meaning just go to a VM. I could just make a Windows VM, copy my files into it, and I would be in charge of IIS and all of that kind of stuff. If I want to use containers and AKS, it's a blog. Let's be real. It's a freaking blog. Do I need Kubernetes to run a blog? I do not. So then maybe app server, app service. But then I have URL management to think about. I had been personally registering SSL certificates and manually installing them every year by logging in and remote desktoping and then installing the certificate into IIS. So I've got certificate management, certificate management. That's a thing. You know, restores, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, cost. These are all questions that I've got. And then moving to Linux, this is multiple, um, multiple requirements. The simplest thing to do would be to take my Windows VM and move it to another Windows VM. But I really felt bad that I was doing a lot of work talking about Azure, doing Azure Friday, but I wasn't really running my machine in Azure. And moving it into a VM is really a simplistic solution. It's not the real answer. And I think it would not be you know, genuine for me to put that into a virtual machine because a VM means that I have to maintain it. I have to run Windows Update. And one of the things that happened when I was running Windows Server 2008 is time passes and it sneaks up on you. Uh, I found that there was an issue with SSL and TLS 1.3 because Windows Server 2008 didn't support that. So a new security standard comes out and I couldn't make Windows Server support it. So then I had to go and Google for TLS 1.3 Windows Server 2008 and find like a special patch. See, ELS 1.3 not supported by Windows Server and the end of support was here. So then people started talking about how can I enable that? There's a whole thing. And then now it's like my operating system is so old that I'm going to fail. And uh, I really wanted to have platform as a service, not infrastructure as a service. This is a classic example. So I got a couple different things. So back up here, this page is not too complicated. This is really a brochure, you know, right? You know, a brochure like a pamphlet. I don't know how to spell brochure. Um, it's like a small page. And this is a page with a for loop. This is the real difficult thing. So I stacked it like this. I said, let me try to move handsome.com first. 
then I'll move the blog and I'll, you know, I'll do that after I do the simple stuff. So with Hanselman.com, if we bring that up, let's go and check out our terminal. This is my terminal. If you like it, uh, you can go up to my blog because I wrote a blog post about how to make your terminal pretty. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Sometimes I have some um, some weird stuff. And you can see that it shows me the branch. And if something's been changed, it shows me the version of .NET for the thing that I'm currently running. And as I type, I get auto complete, which is kind of cool. Then I also have icons for types, which is kind of cool, and color. So I like it to be very colorful. All right, so let's open this. So this was originally on ASP.NET MVC Razor Pages, or, or ASP.NET Web Pages, I think it was called. ASP.NET Web Pages. This is an older technology, 2015. They used to be called Web Matrix, just to give you a sense of how old this is. But the pages themselves are quite simple, right? It's just HTML. And then every once in a while, there's a for loop in the middle somewhere. And most websites that are simple can be broken down into something very basic like this, a template, a layout, or a master page, and then a for loop. So for example, if we look at my home page, which I think is not up to date because I haven't really gone anywhere. Yeah, see, this is quite old. I need to update this. This loop here, this, this bit of information about where I'm speaking, and the blog are the only things on this page that are dynamic. And the rest is just books and podcasts and stuff. So I have a for loop here and I have a for loop here. So the page is index.cshtml, it's just HTML. And then that model right there, that index model is pretty straightforward. You can take a look at this code here, very simple. I have a cache of feed items I read my own XML. So this is actually interesting. I'm using my own RSS feed as my interface. Think about that. I have a blog. I could read my blog's database. I could come up with some kind of an integration point, but it's the internet. So why doesn't one site on my page just go out onto the internet and read my RSS feed? So I actually read my own RSS feed as a web API. That's the simplest thing I can do. And this is what I was talking about. Think about all the ways you could solve this. I could come up with a way for the two apps to talk to each other, or I could just load my own RSS feed. I pull out the titles and the comments, and I cache it right here for four hours. Sometimes people wonder why my homepage is out of date with the blog that I just published. It's four hours. I mean, who cares, right? I could change it to an hour, doesn't matter. So that's nice and clean, and all I do is make a list of feed items. So Razor Pages is super clean and super simple. Even if this code were done in you know, web forms or something, this code right here is pretty standard. It doesn't have anything to do with ASP.NET. Uh, and then the memory, the memory caching is nice and clean. Then for the speaking stuff, I use partial fragments. So I have this thing called speaking partial. And those are done here. So then all I need to do to update my speaking everywhere is I have this little fragment. What's nice about that is, again, I could have put it in a database. I could have put it in a JSON file. I could have done all kinds of things. But it's an HTML fragment. A, a page, a static page like this can be reused and be, be, be pulled in anywhere. So rather than a database, it's just a series of list items. Again, simplest possible thing that could work and it uh, makes moving things around a lot simpler. So getting this to run then on um, ASP.NET was trivial. 
we'll talk about forwarding and port forwarding in a second. Oh, here's an interesting one. So there's a thing called robots.txt. A lot of websites don't do this, and they should. If you hit any website slash robots.txt, it's a place that describes what you allow Google and Bing and other search engines to index. And I have a health check that I'll talk about in a little bit. I don't want that to be searched, and I don't want these ASP.NET pages to be searched, so I disallow them. Usually, robots.txt is um, an actual text file. It's a literal text file. But I wanted to make it so that was gen generatable. I wanted to make it so it could be generated. So when you hit robots.txt, it's actually a razor page. And I have a blog post about this. So in fact, why would I want to do that? I think this is actually very clever, and I'm quite proud of this. Look at lines 9 and 10. If the environment is development or staging, I disallow everything. And if it's in production, I disallow other stuff. So the idea there is I don't want to accidentally have my staging site or my development site be indexed by Google. I'm able to hide my site. So I can use the Razor Pages tag helper to hide everything. Does that make sense? So it looks like a text file, but I'm dynamically generating the text file. And again, look, it's like two lines. There's nothing. There's nothing there. And this is how we lie and say that this is really a text file. Nice and clean. OK. Then I want all this stuff to build. Now, right now, I haven't got it on. Um, uh, I haven't got it on, um, ad, uh, what's it called? Um, Google, uh, GitHub Actions. Right now it's on um, DevOps. How the hell do you log into Azure DevOps? <laughs> I think it's dev. Dev.azure.com. Yeah, but I also have like yeah. Hanselman.visualstudio.com or something. They gave us, I don't want the portal. Where's the thing? If, if you just do dev.azure.com, then it will go down. Oh, there it is. Hanselman.visualstudio.com. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, no one's asking questions, so I'm worried that people hate this. <laughs> okay, so I haven't done anything on, um, I'll show you some things on GitHub Actions later, but the point is no website is too small to not have a little bit of CI CD. And whether it be done on GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps, what's exciting about it is you can do it with a YAML file. Now, I hate YAML, YAML sucks. But um, what's nice about it is that the description for the pipeline and how to build is checked in. So I, I know that it'll work. It's not stored anywhere else. So even though this sucks and it's ugly, it's really quite straightforward. Call restore, call build, call test, call publish. That's it. And then the artifact is a zip file. OK, the zip file is whatever is built from the result of my application. So here's me. Uh, I haven't built my home page in a while. We'll click on my last build. Look at the job. See, it says one artifact, a zip file. So the, the result of the build of my web page is a zip file. And then the zip file can be deployed really cleanly and easily to um, Azure. So we can look at this log. You can see it checked out all the code. It picked a version of .NET. In this case, I'm using .NET 5. I double check the version, do restore, build, publish, publish artifact. Here's where it's building on Linux. And then the publish of the artifact, it uploads the zip file. Now I've separated here, I'm not doing anything with the zip file. I just publish the zip file. Under release, then I take the zip file and I optionally take that artifact, that zip file. And I don't do automatic necessarily. Sometimes I'll want to like, double check it. But I, here, I think I have this one turned on automatic. It'll take the zip file and it'll upload it to, um, 
to Azure um, App Service. Okay. Did the same thing with HanselMinutes.com. We can see that here. Same exact thing. Things started getting interesting when we dealt with DOS blog. So DOS blog, how did I get from .NET 3 to .NET Core? Ah, sorry, Pedro. So the, um, the Razor pages are where the work was. The Razor pages were the, where the intellectual property was. Because there's really, I mean, let's think about this. This is a great question, actually. Yeah, thank you, um, other Pedro, for bringing this up. Okay, so .NET 3 to .NET Core. This is like MVC web pages old. And .NET Core 3 Razor pages. What do they have in common? This is actually .NET 4 or whatever, but still. Okay. What do they have in common? Razor syntax, C sharp, which is versioned. Okay, those are those are things they have in common. Very things, project files, new gets, references. You know it sounds silly, but what I did is I made a new Razor Pages project, totally new. I didn't try to migrate. I made a new project, and then I copied over the common stuff, and I just abandoned the project files completely. And then I just kept recompiling until I got my new get stuff correct. But because I tried to do the simplest possible thing, I realized that it's the C sharp that mattered and the razor syntax that mattered. And having nice, clean um, view models and the rest of the stuff didn't matter so much. What I think people try to do is they try to run automatic upgrades and automatic migrations and they end up fighting with their project files. And I realized that by abandoning the project file, uh, it became a lot cleaner situation. So my project file is is the standard one, right? It's not interesting at all. Now, that said, I do have one unusual thing that I did that I think is worth pointing out. Now, when I say the IP or the intellectual property, I don't know how to spell. So for intellect, everyone's learning that Hanselman can't spell. Okay. I say the IP is in the, this part of the code. What I mean by that is the work. Think about your project and say to yourself, where's all the work? Is it like in the razor syntax? Is it in the C sharp? It's probably not in the project file. Like there's not a lot of work there. It's just metadata. It's just a bunch of stuff. So I don't, when I think about my website, I don't think to myself, man, I really need to keep those project files because I put so much work into them. The works in the HTML, the works in the CSS. So I abandon the parts that are not a lot of work and I rebuild them. But because I was on IIS, because I was on IIS, I forgot there's a piece of intellectual property, a piece of work that was huge. Does anyone recognize this file? an IIS URL rewrite XML file. It's very, very old. And this thing is a lot of work. It's got redirects. It's got um, places where I misspelled URLs and made a redirector to it. You'll know that I have my, my yearly tools list. So when someone goes Hanselman.com slash tools, I needed to go to the latest tools list. I don't even actually know if that works right now. Let's find out. That would be ironic if it didn't, wouldn't it? There, it does work. Okay. So I just went to Hanselman.com slash tools. Who did that redirect? Well, I, over the years, have been building up this really complicated XML file. But it's in the format that IIS understands. And IIS doesn't exist anymore in my world because I'm on Linux on Azure. So here is the part that's glorious. Now this takes a minute to really absorb. The built-in web server that comes with ASP.NET Core, Kestrel, includes a utility function that can read 
the old IIS rewrite format. So now I'm considering this XML as being a piece of um, intellectual property. It's code. So the things I brought with me were my C sharp code, my razor, and my XML file. And I brought that in. Some of you may have uh, what's called an, uh, a mod rewrite file from Apache. We can read mod rewrite files too. Because why would you spend weeks, why would I spend weeks trying to convert this file into a ASP.NET um, pipeline? I mean, that would cost me weeks. This works already. Now, this file is 15 years old. But, I'm, but having an adapter to copy that file in and, and absorb that source code saved me a huge amount of time. Does that make sense? So now I did that for the main page and the podcast. Let's look at the podcast. Podcast right now is on .NET 6, but I think it's actually running in the cloud on 5. Let's take a look. Hansel minutes. Scroll to the bottom. I put a thing at the bottom, and I have details on my blog, where each of my blogs and, po and websites show you the version of .NET they're running on right now in production, the commit, and the build. Now, if you go there and you click on them, you probably won't be able to see that because they go to private repositories. But what's cool about that is that means I can click on them and go directly to which build. So my Hansel Minutes website right now is running a build from yesterday. And if we look at the commit, I can actually go and see the literal line that I changed. And I think that's a great idea. Um, if my website had the ability to be logged in, I think having a feature like this on your production websites is really cool. And you would just say, like, if I'm an administrator, show me, you know, this kind of information, because then I'm not afraid of my website. And that's a really good point. Think about. Um, why people don't touch their websites, because they're afraid of them. They're afraid to build them. I didn't want to be afraid anymore. I was afraid of my websites before. I was constantly messing around with my VM. Now I can tell you exactly what commit was there, what changed, when it built, and I can go back and fix it at any time. Same thing down here. Uh, Luis is asking about my opinion about a migration from Razor to Blazor. Okay, so let's talk about this. This is a really important thing, and I want this might be controversial, but I want people to really think about this. Blazor is WebAssembly and .NET running the .NET virtual machine, the .NET common language runtime in JavaScript on an iPhone, on an Android phone, on a Windows machine. It's great. It's great for line of business applications. It's great for not having to learn JavaScript. But it's not the web. There is no reason. This is the controversial part. There is no reason for me to take my home page or my podcast site, which is a list of people's faces and links to listen to their, their shows, and turn this into Blazor. Why would I do that? It would make it slower. It would make it bigger. It would make it impossible to search by Google. It's not a web page anymore. Blazor is not for web pages. Blazor is for web applications. This is hardly a web application. I have a search here. That's a simple JavaScript to go and search for things. Right? That took me three lines of JavaScript. Do I need to do that in Blazor? I don't. Do I need to download an entire WebAssembly recompiled version of .NET so that I can have a click and search? No. So I really think people need to remind themselves about how the internet works. Because if we look here at this page, which is the page of the archives, let's take a look. For each show in shows. Link, image, some lazy loading code, the show number, and the title. 
This is a web page. This is a web page. There's no reason for this to be Blazor. Gmail, that'd be a cool Blazor app. Outlook.com, that'd be a cool Blazor app, right? An ordering system, a shopping cart, but a blog? No. 99% read only. The web is meant to be read. The original designer of the web created it so that we could read papers, scientific papers over the internet. This is not an application as it is a page. I'm curious if anyone disagrees, but I really think we need to remind ourselves that the new and the shiny is not always the simple. This is pretty damn simple, and so far you should be impressed how simple it is. There's not a lot here. Not trying to be aggressive. I apologize if anyone thinks that I'm picking on Luis here for the very good question. But I'm just trying to make a point about why would I not move this to Blazor? Can I can I add something there, Scott? Please. What about what about Jekyll or Louis? You know the stack. There you go. Now, now you're ones. thinking. So Tiago's nailed it. The right thing for me to do is move all of this to a static site generator. But I'm comfortable in Razor. I had a bunch of intellectual property, intellectual property in Razor, so I kept it there. What I'd like, what the right thing for me to do is to come up with a static site generator that took Razor and generated the web pages for me, and then my site wouldn't be dynamic anymore and it would be even cheaper. The only reason I didn't do that on the blog, which we'll talk about in a second, is because I still want the blog to have comments. And a static site generator would require pages to be generated for each individual post, and then some dynam dynamism or some dynamic bit, which would be, um, and I don't want to use a thing like discuss or some third party commenting system. I don't think it's a blog without comments. If I removed comments, then yes, a static site generator. And I think there was one that was called YM. That's a .NET static. Here it is, ym.io. Ah, it's been re. It looks like it's been rebranded. Now it's called static, with a Q. So static is a. I think it's .NET. Yeah, it's a .NET console application. So that would be the simplest thing to do. So let's now juxtapose the difference between a static site generator and Blazor. A static site generator runs once each time a blog post gets generated, and then a million people can visit your page, and the only work that your computer has to do is send a piece of static text up across the wire. So a million people visit, and a million static pages are delivered. If we did it in Blazor, I have to deliver the entire .NET framework a million times, or put it on a CDN, and then I still have to shove you know, a megabyte across the wire every single time. But maybe the administration side should be Blazor, right? The login page and the, the, the admin, and that would be a great place for Blazor to live, right? You know, the product catalog, no. Shopping cart, yes. Admin site, yes. That's my opinion of where Blazor fits. Good question. But yeah, static site generator is the right thing to do. But um, I really like Razor, so I, I did that. Now. The blog gets really interesting because the blog has two things to think about. Let me show you the database. Let's look at Hanselman's blog database. You're going to be scandalized when you see this, my friends. And you're going to say, hey, what kind of database does he store 20 years of blog posts in? Buckle up, kids. It's going to be scary. That is 20 years of blog posts. It is 5,000 XML files. Look at what that looks like. Let's pick up one of these files. Here's a, here's a blog post from 2005. How to connect a drive letter to Microsoft front page. Good times, good times. Okay, 
Let's look at a newer one, shall we? Maybe something from not 2002. Here's one from last week. How to open and resize split panes in Windows Terminal. The content is here in HTML. So, should we feel bad? Should I be sad that this is an XML? What if it was in YAML? Would that make you feel better? What if it was in JSON? Here's the dirty little secret, my friends. It doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't matter. It's name value pairs. This could be an INI file. It doesn't matter. XML, JSON, YAML, INI files, MongoDB, Redis, a database table, Azure table storage, it doesn't matter. Because I'm loading it up, I'm holding it in memory in a distributed hash table, doesn't matter. Could be a memory cache, object cache, Redis, uh, could just be a regular hash table. Once it gets out of this serialized format, it's in memory in a hash table and it's a for loop. So we could, we all could work for the same company and we could get together in a room as architects and we could argue about this. And we could be successful whether this was YAML or JSON or XML. Is it pretty? It was in 2005. This was the height of technology. But ultimately, once it gets into memory, it doesn't matter because it's all abstracted away. Now, again, to the point before about static site generators, should I make a static site generator for this? Absolutely. But remember, the goal was a couple of things. It was easily moved to, blo to, uh, to Linux, and it was break no URLs. That's where things really got interesting. So some of my URLs are pretty old. Let's try if we can find one. Let's go and Google for an old um, URL. I think, all the, I think all of my old URLs are gone. But let's make an old URL. I'm going to create an old one. My URLs 20 years ago were camel cased and had the ASPX extension at the end there. Typo? It, Just watch it is out a back uh, on screen. Got screen. it. Yeah. There you go. Pair, pair programming, my friends. Oh. That URL? I get redirected cleanly because for no other reason than when I would blog something and it would go over to Hacker News or Stack Overflow or somewhere that someone would, um, you know, talk about my stuff. I was losing credibility. The people on Hacker News were mean, right? It's like showing up to a party wearing the wrong shirt and someone would say, oh, look at that old man with his old URL. You're stupid. And you hit enter and now you go from Pascal casing to what's called kebab casing, like a shish kebab, and it's got the arrow going all the way through it because that's the style. And if a style changes in the future, maybe it becomes underscores, that's fine. I can do that. But I needed to make sure that I could change 2,000, 3,000 URLs and not have anything break. And that was easily done again with uh, the way that rewriting and URL redirection is done in ASP.NET. So all of those URLs were maintained and they were 301s, 301 permanent. Um, so then that slowly got Google to update them as well. So in the, in the, in the past, um, oh, and additionally, there's a sitemap. I think it's at sitemap.xml or maybe it's a slash sitemap. Where's the sitemap now? A sitemap is a thing that people don't usually do. I can't 
can't remember where we put ours. And a sitemap looks like this, and it tells Google and Bing how often things change. Root directory, Scott Duffy says, let's see. Now, Google Webmaster Tools. Let's go find out where my sitemap is. Blah, 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 blah. Go away, I don't want all this crap. Search console. We're crying out loud. I have one of these already. Go away. Ah! There it is. Gonna be verified? Darn right, it's been auto verified. I haven't been here in a while. Sitemaps. Oh, well, this is all changed. This sucks. Scott Duffy, when did all this change? Oh, you guys suck. I don't want to upload this thing. This is stupid. Ew, you guys are awful. Google makes life so complicated for people. Yay! Whatever. Okay. Where's the sitemap? Slash, okay, slight slash, there it is. Site slash blog slash site slash map. Hanselman slash blog slash site slash map. There it is. Yay! See? Again, this is something that would have had to have been auto generated if we did this with a static site generator. OK, but it points out like, here you go. Here's my ultimate PowerShell prompt. I put in that it gets changed weekly. All of this stuff is something to remember. So one of the points that Scott Duffy made there about slash sitemap dot XML, that probably should be uh, something I should have redirected. So the way I have it right now is I could go into that IIS rewrite and I could really, really quickly go and do that, which is cool. Now let's talk about these URL structures because I think that's important. I wanna make sure that we don't forget that. Remember, these were easy to move because they're razor pages and I have a different philosophy here. That DOS blog thing was originally in web forms. Now in the old days in DOS blog, we would do this with web forms, but remember the, the, the syntax of web forms is actually surprisingly close to the syntax of razor pages. If you remember, I'll show you a notepad. Razor pages look like this. You have some HTML, right? Then you have a thing and you have like this. And then if this was gonna be generated dynamically, we would go like this. Web forms look like. Razor pages just look like that. So again, where's my intellectual property? Where's my IP? Where was the work done? My theme files in DOS blog. So I just converted them from web forms to razor pages. Again, not that complicated, surprisingly easy. And then what happened was we used .NET standards. So if we go to GitHub, Mark Downey, who's my coworker, and his name is Papa String, he plays string instruments. Mark Downey here lives out of uh, Columbus, Ohio. And he moved DOS blog, which was a web forms app over to .NET core. 
he did it in a very clever way. This part was moved from web forms to razor pages, but the services, the original services are all still .NET standard. And the only thing he had to worry about were things that were Windows specific. So, you know, paths, backslashes versus forward slashes and things like that. There was one place where we accessed the registry. It is surprisingly easy to get a Windows only application moved over to Linux. We make a new project, we start copying the code over, and then we look for places where we're doing Windows specific things. Uh, for example, you know, system.environment.newline or system.environment.path separator, or I think it's actually system.directory.io.path separator. And when he made the theming engine, here's an example of a DOS blog theme. So like here's a blog page and used partials. So instead of using a, uh, a child control in an ASPX page, we use a partial. Instead of using what were called bee stings, we would use these. So I literally sat there with my 15-year-old web form and, and, and just looking for places where it looked like this, swapped them out to that. And then Mark did something really, really clever which to this day I am still impressed with. I'll show you my one of my themes. He came up with some really, really nice looking. Um, what are they called? Tag helpers. Let's look at some tag helpers. OK, so this is how it used to look. comment link here, formatted date here with that old style web forms looking thing, right? Now let's look at what it looks at today. Tag helpers are the best. People in the chats loving their tag helpers. Tag helpers basically allowed Mark to move DOS blog over in a clean and thoughtful way. And uh, it accelerates your development so quickly. Let me find an example. Look at that. List of categories. Edit a post. Delete a post. So every control in web forms turned into a tag helper. Big partial views or partial web, web web forms controls turn into partials. Very, very clean. And again, all of those object models that we were passing, like lists of controls, lists of comments, lists of posts that we would pass into a web form, just turned into view models. Right? Life is just a series of four each's. So then let's go into Azure itself. Here's where the magic happens. Now, this is the one thing that I I'm not thrilled with is it's, a, it's still a little expensive, which is Azure um, Front Door. But the new version of Azure Front Door apparently is quite uh, reasonably priced, but I haven't moved yet. So I have one basic Windows uh, web um, app service. And I have six apps on it. We'll take a look at those apps. My old This Developer's Life podcast and some existing startups and work. None of this is Hanselman.com. Then I have the Linux app service plan here. I have four apps on it. Azure Friday, the podcast, the brochureware homepage and the blog. Okay. Here's the blog. It's not working very hard. Looks like you know 200 web requests, a, I can think a second or whatever. You know, it's pretty. The average response time is 30 milliseconds, so it's quite fast. 
But how do we manage the URLs? Well, Azure Front Door, they have a new premium version that I haven't upgraded to yet, is pretty clever. Azure Front Door allows you to change the way URLs come in and decide how you want them to be passed to your backend pools. So there's the main website and there's the blog. I have a staging website. And then I have the two front ends for at, you know, for handsome.com. And then I have rules here. So for example, when the pattern matches slash blog coming in as HTTP or HTTPS, you route it to the backend pool with HTTPS. So what that means is if we go and look at my blog, Here's the dirty little secret. Look at this. Look at that funny URL. Right? That's where the blog really lives. But no one can visit that one. They visit handsome.com slash blog. Now here's where things get a little confusing, and this is important because remember I said here with IIS, when you put something one directory down, you get a free app. And IIS would tell your application that it lives there. But the reality is, my website is at something like hanselmanblog.azurewebsites.net. This is really important. My website doesn't know that it's here. It's not. That's a lie. And that can be really confusing because your, your website could end up accidentally generating URLs that don't have that subdirectory. So the internet solved that problem with a thing called X forwarded. And I think I did a blog post on this. It's called application base URLs. Azure Front Door is a reverse proxy, right? Our website is behind that. So when you hit Hanselman.com, you're hitting Azure Front Door, and then Azure Front Door looks at the URL and says, is this the blog? Is this the home page? And it will forward things along. So Hanselman.com slash blog slash foo needs to turn into slash foo, or my, my redirects and things won't work. So is the path being removed or is a path being added? You have to ask yourself those things. The thing called use path base that's built into ASP.NET that says you live at slash blog. But things like Nginx or Apache or Azure Front Door or any kind of reverse proxy has this concept of forwarded headers. They're called X forwarded for or X forwarded, and it'll basically pass along the information that you need. So you want to be aware of that kind of stuff. And those features are built into um, ASP.NET. So if we return back to Azure and we look at this URL here and we visit it, see how it says forbidden? I don't want anyone to visit my blog that way. Hang on, my wife is calling. Everything okay? I think it's like thirty dollars, thirty-five, whatever he says. That's weird. My wife is asking me a question about. Well, she doesn't usually call when she knows I'm giving a talk. So you see how this says forbidden? That's because I have a list here that says, here are the hosts that are allowed. So I only want my website to, to reply when someone hits Hanselman.com, right? I don't want it to reply when they visit Azure websites, because then it might be accidentally um, Googled and uh, not Googled, but uh, crawled. So in doing that, that has set me up for success. Indexed. Thank you for that word. Appreciate that. Indexed. Uh, that means that I can individually scale these things. I can individually move these things around. 
Now, one thing that I haven't done yet, and I go back and forth on, but you might find it to be interesting, is there's a concept called path mappings. If I've got 5,000 XML files in a folder, wouldn't it be cool if I put them on Azure storage? Then I could run my entire application in a container. I would go here to path mappings and I would mount a storage container and I would mount it at slash blog slash content where I keep all of my XML. Can anyone guess why that is not a good idea? It could have been an amazing idea, but something very specific. And by the way, my application wouldn't need to change. This is what's so cool about it, right? My app goes looking on the local hard drive for those XML files. And I thought this would be amazing. I'll put all of my content in Azure storage. It'll be back triply backed up and it'll work great. Why did that end up being a bad idea? 5,000 XML files. Cost, Scott Duffy says cost. No, it would have been incredibly cheap because Azure storage is cheap. Performance. Turns out that for looping over <laughs> 5,000 XML files over the network is not performant. My application was written in such a way that it assumed 20 years ago that a for loop over the current directory would be cheap, but it turned into many, many thousands of network calls because Azure is lying to you here. It, it's great for looking up a file, for grabbing one file, but it's not optimized for spinning through thousands of files, then making metadata calls to get, like when I go and say something like, check the date modified, I'm assuming that that's instantaneous. But in fact, it's a network call. So um, while it's a really cool idea, I don't think it would be a good idea unless I paid extra. Uh, Luis is asking, how much do I pay? Let's find out. So if you go to Azure Cost Management and you go down to your individual accounts and then go down into Cost Analysis, there's a section that will show you what you pay on as individual services. Uh, yeah, and Tiago, you're doing them over the internet, but you're not actually doing them over the internet if they stay in the same location. Right, so they would be local to my data center if I was in both West US for storage and West US for um, the, the other stuff. So the cost of the blog is about $87. Uh, I have a CDN for my images. The cost right now, my number one cost is front door. Um, I think I'm gonna be able to get that cost down to $30. Um, with the new Azure front door because they changed the pricing. And I'll show you that in a second. Um, but the Azure Azure front door new preview pricing has changed. And that's the number one thing right now that's costing me. I want to change it to this new one here. See this monthly price on the new preview. Uh, and they've changed the pricing, particularly it was for rules. There you go. I'll do, see, I look, first 250 million requests is like nine cents for 10,000. So it's going to be much, much cheaper. They've completely changed the pricing. So you can see right now that my front door costs more than my Azure App Service. I could have used Cloudflare, which would have lowered my costs. But because I'm going to be moving to Azure front door premier, a preview rather, that should lower by 60 bucks. This is the old pricing. Sorry, thank you, Pedro. This is old pricing. Um, and then right now I have single instances and I'm doing everything on an app service. And this is an important point. You can save money because this app service here has four apps in it. I just have one instance of the app service. And one of the things people don't realize on Azure is the thing that you're getting cheap is memory. Number one thing people forget about. They think it's about CPU. Look at my CPU. It's barely working. But I'm hashing the entire blog in memory. I'm using almost 50% of a three and a half gig system here. And that's allowing me to have really great perf. So I could probably load another couple of apps in there. 
So my next plan is to get rid of this server farm here, this basic one. But look how much memory I'm using here, 60%. I really believe that when you move something into the cloud, you can write it in such a way that it starts knowing that it's in the cloud. And since I know I'm in a cloud that has a lot of RAM, I'm going to use all that RAM. It's expensive for me to go to the disk. It's cheap for me to load stuff into memory. So my application starts up really slowly. Um, and then once it's started up slowly, when it's cached everything, then it's super fast. Then I made dashboards that look like this. So then you can see, like here was probably a reset. Look like there's a 100 millisecond server response time here. There was a burst. You can see there's a burst of CPU at this moment, maybe something reset. I could go back and find out maybe there was an exception. You see my availability is pretty good, 100% today. I have some failed requests. I can pick on these here and go and dig in and find out what requests are failing. So it looks like here we've got, this is good. So here's a bug. Here we can see some people trying to get robots.txt. That doesn't really count as a bug. Um, some people trying to get my binaries by looking at the root directory. That's a bug. What's going on here? We have 5,000 failed requests. Someone is trying to look to see if my archive goes back to 1899. And I'm getting a argument out of range. So this looks like a, a script kitty or someone who is trying to be a jerk. So I'll click and say, say, show me all the telemetry. It looks like there were 2,000 requests over a five minute period. And someone is just writing a script and trying to do something mean to my blog. I probably will block that, uh, that IP address. Someone in the United Kingdom is being a jerk. That's one of the benefits you get from Azure, just being able to go and like dig into a problem like that really, really quickly and find out what's going on and like what that burst was costing and if that was a big deal or not. Uh, with all these changes that I suffer on SEO, I did not suffer in any way because I was super careful to make sure that I had redirects for everything. I kept the redirects as 302 temporary redirects until I converted them to 301s when I was confident. Uh, Pedro Sosa makes a comment that I could make a warm up to do the most access pages. Absolutely, I could do that. Instead, on startup, I do the warm up uh, and I just cache them all. Uh, right now, I don't know what the most access pages are, so I just keep them all. Uh, Tiago points out you can load lots of stuff in a one core th uh, 3.5 gig RAM app. Exactly. So I'm treating this app as a static web app except it's static in memory once it loads, you see? So it's a bit of a hack, right? I should be doing this static where I do all of the work, compile static pages and dump them somewhere. Uh, instead, I compile them in memory, right, with Razor and then store them. You can see, look, click, click, click. It's milliseconds because they're, they're static in memory once I've cached everything. So the other thing was uh, being smart about um, DNS. When I did this, I had everything at staging.hanselman.com for actually two months. So what I did was I had hanselman.com and people would go and visit like old, old URLs like this. And then they would go and visit here and they would get the new style so every once in a while i would do load testing where i would tweet urls like this to see if they worked and because this page had that robots.txt where it wasn't being indexed uh it was um it was it was safe and then when i turned off staging everything switched like this i would say it took several months and I actually wrote up a lot of details on this. If you search my blog and I, you search for, um, I think it's migration, Azure migration. Here we go, migrating this blog to Azure. 
So I've got how we did it, how I did it. I mean, I was all by myself. Here we go. Moving the sites, dealing with application base URLs, moving it from .NET, you know, core, and also continuing to upgrade, um, testing it in WSL, like making sure it worked in Linux. That was making sure it works in Linux. So right now I'm just in PowerShell, right? But if we go and open up Ubuntu on the same machine using WSL, and then go and bring it down, I can use Docker, I can use whatever. So Hanselman core, so here's the blog, git pull, dot build, dot net run, check it out. That's Azure Friday. Oh, so this is a thing that actually I noticed, by the way, this is kind of funny. You see how I'm on Hanselman.com, but it's loading Azure Friday? We've been putting in uh, the ability to have these web pages be installed as applications. So if you go to AzureFriday.com, you can install it as an Azure Friday app, right? And um, this unfortunately registers a service worker with localhost 5000, which I'm finding is really, really annoying. I need to write a blog post about this. Now you have to go to F12 tools, open the dev tools, go over to like applications somewhere in here, and then go to service workers and then unregister all these service workers and then hit F5. You get the complaint about the cert being old and then you get the right site. So if you're doing anything with service workers or offline websites, set your URL so that they're not all localhost 5001. Don't reuse your URLs. Otherwise, you'll get old versions and cached versions of your websites. So there is Hanselman.com locally running on Linux. And the nice thing about this is if I was using you know, Visual Studio, whether it be Visual Studio 2022 or 2019, or I'm doing the work in Visual Studio Code, Here's Visual Studio 2022 preview. When I load this thing up, you'll notice in a second, the play button up here that says attach, it's gonna change. I can run it on IIS, I can run it on Docker, or I can run it in Linux. So I can run my app directly in Linux from VS. Again, once I've proven that I can run it in Linux locally here, then I know that it's going to run fine in the, in the cloud on Linux. So that made testing really, really easy. Oh, actually, Pedro, Sousa, you're doing something in, in WordPress. Here's a controversial idea for you. I know that your mind is going to explode. Do you know what Peach Pie is? Peach Pie compiles PHP to .NET, and they can run WordPress in Azure and .NET. And it's really fast and secure because you're using .NET security instead of PHP security. You can go and check it out online. They can compile the PHP into IL code. You can prove it and see exactly what it looks like. So here's hello world in PHP turning into C sharp. And you can run it in, um, in Azure. It's pretty cool. They've got all of it working. You take a look at them on um, on blog, and they've even can do it PHP to Blazor. It's pretty crazy. Check it out. Cool. All right, <clears throat> I'm almost out of time here. I've got a meeting in four minutes. Any questions? Is this okay? If you guys have questions, you can you can unmute yourselves. By the way. Yeah, we are on Teams, right? Not on YouTube. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. the idea. Or they are so just they are too just... too shy, you know, Scott. No, it's okay. I think people are overwhelmed with the amount of information that you you dropped on us, and so many, so much cool stuff. Um, with simple, keep it, keeping it simple, actually. Mm. Yeah, for me, for me, it was it was a great session because I was uh, able to, you know, see stuff that I used to work. 
<laughs> with code, <laughs> which I don't I don't do on a daily basis anymore, unfortunately. Um, and so it was it was pretty pretty cool to see to see all of um, all of that again. And I think it was it was to be honest a great session. We could really understand uh, different ways and that that you use Scott depending on the website to migrate. Um, so questions, guys, come on. Oh, I think we have Pedro as a question, Scott, on the chat. Uh, yes, if I had multiple instances of the application, would it have a problem with the multiple XML files as a database? Absolutely. So what I would do with that, if I, I haven't done that yet, but what I would do is I would declare one of them primary. So I would have mm -hmm. multiple instances and I would have one of them be the read write one and the other ones be read only. Because a blog is 90% read only, and it only updates when there's either a comment or um, a new blog post. I would have either a distributed cache like Redis or a way to invalidate the cache. So if someone wrote a comment or someone updated a blog post, I would invalidate the distributed cache and then everyone would read off the uh, the latest files again. So I would I would it would introduce a concept of eventual consistency. OK, so, uh, sorry. Uh, so you will persist one uh, if you have a new blog entry, you will persist one in XML. Yep. And then invalidate the cache of the others. Okay. Yep. Just to exactly. refresh. Okay. Exactly. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Okay, guys. So I think Scott has a meeting in one minute. So. Yep. Let's have... release. Let's release Scott. Scott, thank you very much for being here with um with us, and uh, we hope to see you again soon somewhere in Ignite, maybe. Okay. Yeah. We'll see. see some sessions we'll see. there. Soon as the uh, as soon as we're out of the panini, <laughs> <laughs> hope everybody can stay safe. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye, Scott. See you. Bye bye. Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Scott.